Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to day two of our series uh, on palliative care in COVID-19 um, settings. And this utilizes the resource toolkit that all of you have been given access to. Uh, before we begin, I'm just going to quickly request that all of you check that your names are displayed rather than your your device names that will help us identify you better. Uh, I will also request that you're mindful that your mics are on silent as the presentation is being made. Uh, do use the uh, raise hand option if you'd like to contribute uh, verbally in some way. Otherwise, of course, the chat box is open. Um, my name is Smriti. I'm the Director of Programs at Pallium India. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce our faculty for today. Uh, Dr. Sunita Daniel will be our lead facilitator. She is a specialist medical officer in the Department of Palliative Medicine from the General Hospital in Ernakulam. And our co-facilitator today is uh, Dr. Raj Shri. Uh, she's, an, uh, she's trained in anesthesiology, has a fellowship in palliative medicine, and is a palliative care trainer uh, at the Institute of Palliative Care in Trishore and has also been a faculty member with Pallium India for several years and is also an assistant professor at the Amrita Institute of Medical Science in Kuchin. Uh, both Dr. Raji and Dr. Sunita have been deeply involved in the development of the resource toolkit and have contributed very, very uh, intensely to the, to the ebook as well as to uh, the entire course. And I'm very pleased to hand it over now to Dr. Raj. Dr. Raji, are you, are you here? Thank you, Smriti. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, friends. I am Dr. Rajasri, a palliative care doctor from Central Kerala. Right now, I am speaking from Calicut, that is one of the northern districts of Kerala. So, uh, I am so happy to meet the bench of uh, enthusiastic healthcare professionals to, who are ready to provide palliative care service to people who need it uh, at most. So we have commenced our session yesterday where uh, the experienced and distinguished palliative care faculty, Dr. Moira Leng had a, given a lecture on decision making and triaging. And we, she had uh, very well commented on the relevance of palliative care uh, in a pandemic situation like COVID. Because any disease, we have seen with uh, Ramesh, that any disease as illness will touch upon many aspects of human life other than uh, physical. Uh, she has shown it very clearly that, you know, like physic, uh, not only physical, but, uh, you know, psychological, spiritual and social and COVID-19 is not an exemption. And, you know, uh, she discussed uh, regarding how to uh, move forward once the patient is diagnosed with COVID-19. And uh, she's, uh, she had shown the multiple levels of care with where the mild, the mild or to moderate symptoms are treated, uh, like uh, primary health centers or first line COVID hospitals. And little more, I mean, patients with little more severe illness will be managed in Talu hospitals, that is second line COVID hospitals, where patients with severe ARDS or severe pneumonia or severe symptoms will be taken to or referred to third line COVID hospitals like medical colleges or district hospitals. So we have uh, uh, different levels of, uh, you know, like triaging system as well, ranging from, I mean, ranging from ASHA to uh, a senior specialist, uh, um, the medical professional, uh, along with other healthcare professionals uh, giving uh, care to the COVID patients. And uh, she has shown very clearly that how an ethical framework and performance scale will help us in uh, facilitating or moving forward with goals of care discussion. And uh, how, I mean, how important that at each step of uh, uh, COVID-19 management. It is very important in, 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 with respect to any disease, but COVID-19 because of the disease trajectory and multiple issues uh, confined to the, I mean, specific to the disease, it is it's equally important. And she has also emphasized that the mutual respect and communications are the cornerstones of any healthcare scenario. Uh, 
So today we have symptom management, which is of utmost, it's a very important component of palliative care because the quality of life principally rests upon symptom management and in COVID-19, it poses extra challenges. So today we have a very experienced faculty to deliver the lecture on symptom management in COVID-19 pandemic. That is Dr. Sunida Daniel. She is one of the key persons behind this toolkit. I am so happy to hand over the session to Dr. Sunida Daniels. Now, Sunida, it's over to you. Uh, thank you, Raji, ma'am. And uh, welcome to you all. I'll first start by sharing the screen. Okay, is the screen visible now? Uh, yes, ma'am. Can you speak a little more louder? Uh, before Sunita chipping, shall I make a comment? Yeah, Raju? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Uh, I, I, I invite all participants to fill the chat box with their suggestions and comments because it's the suggestions or your inputs uh, make us lead forward. So feel free to uh, put your suggestions in the chat box as the session moves on. Thank you. Over to you, Sunita. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, and please uh, stop me if I'm not audible or, or if, the, if, you, if you can't see the screen. Um, so I hope you have had a chance to go through the webinar. And uh, I, I and thank you very much for filling in the uh, pre-course questionnaire. Lots of people have filled in. And going to the questionnaire, um, I've realized that most of you has had some palliative care training before. So I'm expecting this session to be really, really interactive, where we can uh, share our experiences and learn from each other. Uh, just out of interest, if you had a chance to go to the webinar, can you just put, quickly put in the chat box, yes, so that I can know who all had a chance to go to the webinar. Is that okay before I start? If not, it's fine, I can continue. Yeah, I saw one S. Good, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. So, so uh, what I'm trying to cover in this session are the competencies in the entire resource toolkit. Uh, hopefully, by attending this echo session, you'll be able to understand more about the algorithms um, of physical symptoms. And also, in the end, I'll be mentioning a list of essential medications. Uh, before I start, just want to clarify that everything, whatever material is in the echo session and the webinar, is from the ebook. So, you can read it uh, at your leisure, download and read all the materials available there. Coming to the learning objectives. So this echo session again will be more, mostly concentrating on the symptom complex of agitation and breathlessness. Even though we'll be briefly mentioning other symptoms also, this is mainly to concentrate on the most common symptom of um, agitation and breathlessness, which is uh, managed the yeah. Um, can you pull your microphone more closer to you? Okay. Is that, is that better? Yes, it is perfect. Right. So we come back to hope you remember Ramesh. So we come back to him because uh, throughout this week, you will have to deal with, uh, with, with Ramesh's symptoms and his family. So, um, so uh, Suresh, Ramesh's son, he calls COVID-19 helpline and says that his father has symptoms of sore throat and dry cough. So remember that uh, his, one of his sons had come from abroad and they are worried about COVID-19. Now Ramesh has developed some symptoms. At the advice of the medical officer, it was decided to move the gentleman to the nearest COVID treatment center. A nasopharyngeal swab is sent for testing and the result is positive for severe acute respiratory syndrome virus or SARS-CoV-2. Ramesh is clearly anxious and unsettled. He keeps asking to see his family. Will I ever see them again? So I would like to think, uh, you all to think about Ramesh's situation now. What are the issues concerning him and his family? And how will you respond to them? So let's take a short break and I would like to hear from you about what do you think is happening with Ramesh and his family? What is thing is happening in Ramesh's mind? Uh, what are his concerns? What is in the family's mind? And if, if Ramesh asks you that question, if you're the doctor looking after him, so will I, see, will I ever see them again? How will you respond to that? Okay. 
can see chats coming in. Um, feels lonely. That's right, Dr. Nivedia. Separated from family, separated. That's, that's a major worry, isn't it? Yeah. What else is happening with him? Okay, somebody has put, I can't hear anything. Is that my uh, audio problem or? Uh, no, ma'am, we can hear you only. Okay. Uh, anxious, probably distressed, yeah. And uh, Shilpa has come forward with, uh, you know, suggestion that he might uh, feel disconnected. And Dr. Abhishek has posted that he might be having fear of death because the uncertainty with respect to COVID-19 and isolation. Yes, once COVID-19 is diagnosed, um, the patient is very well isolated in the family, also have to go for quarantine. And he might be worried about the comorbid conditions, very good. Sins of impending doom and death, scared of the future. Not only the physical aspect, uh, how the family is about to move forward and the separation anxiety, very good, very good. Social isolation. So that's it's really good uh, to see all the chats coming in and uh, yeah, really on a fifth mention family support in future yes. yes yes it's true how the family is going to support him because they are going to be separated and family itself will be worried about caring uh Ramesh. family safety yes yes family will get very good stress of pro stress of prone of infection to all family members it's very true very true Fear of ventilation, yes. Any person would be scared of hospital admission and, uh, you know, aggressive management. Very good responses. I think Dr. Shilpa has put in, I would introduce myself and like to hear all of his concerns, fears and respond. Very good. So yes, that's very the good, answer good. to the question. How will you respond to them? Uh, and I did see a chat about uh, access to smart devices with video chat. Ex exactly. So... That's the only option right now available for us, isn't it? If he ends up uh, getting admitted to a center and then he's not able to see his family, the least we can offer is a video chat. So very good. Um, I think they're all thinking in the right direction. Okay, social stigma, financial. Okay, so I'll just uh, move on. And, and uh, uh, Sunil, I would like to come and, you know, like, you know, that I would listen to his concerns, fears, and then respond. That is a very, very, I mean, very good or excellent comment. That is, that shows that you are ready to listen to Ramesh before responding anything. It's a very good comment. Thank you, Shilpa, for that. Thanks, Rajiv, ma'am, for highlighting the point. It's, and, and it's very, very important for us as, uh, as physicians, uh, you know, to actually listen to the patient first and uh, yes. find out exactly what his what concerns are, which yes. probably might not be what we are thinking about the patient. It might be completely different to what we are thinking. So it's important to listen to the patient. And then okay. Krishnan has pointed out internet double-edged sword because, yeah. uh, you know, information overloading, which adds to... Uh, anxiety and fear of transmission to family members, which makes him guilty. Very good, very good. Very good. Keep going. Thank you all. That's really great. So um, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide and uh, Rajima will be keeping an eye on the chat. So please yes. put your thoughts in and we'll discuss in between. So uh, Ramesh is now admitted to COVID center uh, and on do day two of his admission, his conditions worsens. He develops high fever, a dry cough, difficulty breathing. He also reports feeling very tired and unwell. On examination, his vitals are heart rate of 120 per minute, temperature of 38.7, SATs of 88, blood pressure 140, 90. The clinical team comes to an agreement that a transfer to a critical care facility is not recommended and want to focus on excellent symptom control. I'm hoping the clinical team had, uh, this, uh, had maybe listened to a session yesterday and thought that maybe it's not in the best interest of me. So they came to that decision. So the medical office is now worried. How are they going to inform him and his family? And the son has been calling and saying, please do everything for my father. How will you handle this situation? So, yeah, please put your comments in now. So we have come to a medical decision, but now we need to communicate to the family. And how are we going to do that? Because the son, there's one, the two sons, one son probably would be very, very guilty because he thinks he must have you know, given his father the infection. So he would be thinking, please do everything for my father. So what is he thinking? Is it just to make him comfortable or, you know, so you can put your thoughts in. 
Sonali Manju has put in arrange for an in person. Uh, yeah, yeah. Arrange for an in person family meeting or son. Yeah. What can be done so far? Hmm. We'll talk to family over phone, allay their anxiety. And Nivedia suggest, I mean, ask his sons what, what are his worries right now. Hmm. Okay, okay. Exploring the concerns, the open question. So do you, uh, do you think, um, uh, after listening to yesterday's uh, session and uh, as, you, as a physician looking after, are you comfortable with making a decision like that? And if so, are you confident in uh, conveying that to family? Um, you know, or if you have any concerns, just open up in the chat. Sonali has again come forward with, you know, allowing son to express his feelings, worries, and practical concerns. Everything points to being open to uh, the uh, comments or concerns from the family and particularly from the son. You know, yeah. uh, so we need to find out why, why the son is so worried, isn't it? Uh, what exactly he is, is in, in his mind. Yeah. And anxiolytic counsel and ask for concerns for both patient and son. Yeah. Okay. We may need it. We may need that. We may need that, yeah. At least Martin, a video so call to involve them in the decision. Yeah. Same decision. Okay. Once things are all explained, they may make the same decision. Chairman has put as what yes. he means by saying everything. What he means by everything. Yes, exactly. Yeah. We need to reassure saying that uh, we are here to help his father no matter what, even if the goals of care are not to transfer to an ICU, he will not be abandoned. Very reassuring, a positive, uh, uh, positive uh, comment or with realistic hope. That's a good comment by, from Sonali. So I think one thing that we all have to uh, make sure is that we obviously communicate with the family, but uh, we use algorithms, we do the proper documentation of everything that we have discussed and everything uh, and what we are basing it on. So why did we make this clinical decision? Make sure it's documented. And as we said, you know, make, make an arrange a video call, at least a video call with the family. Uh, if possible, let the family see the patient, and uh, you know if it's if if they if they can see him, and if the patient is well enough for that, and have a have a discussion like that, um, and uh, you know you, you will have sessions on communication. So there will be different protocols will be explained to you, uh, tools that can be used uh, to improve the communication skills, which will be taken tomorrow. Uh, so express clearly that keeping him pain free and comfortable is the main goal, knowing that inevitable may be, may be close, even death. Yet medical team is with them through every step of the way. Yes, it's very good. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to move forward now. And so, so why is it different? Why are we doing... Uh, a session just on COVID-19. Uh, and uh, as we can see, most of you have, have already got palliative care experience, but why, why are you coming to get, get an, this additional session COVID-19? What is different? So we, we had an, um, there was a blog published uh, in BMG Opinion from doctors looking after patients uh, in a small town in Italy. And they found that they, they've redefined the role of palliative care in COVID-19, where they are faced with an uh, ultra emergency situation. Sorry, is my connection lost? Okay. Uh, they're faced with an ultra emergency situation. And you can see that there's no, there's no relationship with the patient and the family. So just what happened to Ramesh here, he has been separated from the patient and the family. There's no typical palliation timing for sharing and planning the treatment path. So all those patients that we have seen in the past, we had at least, usually we get a referral at least have times, some time to establish rapport with the patient and the family. But right now in COVID-19, it's like an emergency for us. We don't have the time. We don't have the luxury of the time to share the path and uh, discuss the treatment. And um, 
deaths are usually linked to a traumatic psychological experience and is traumatic for the family and the members of the treating team, mainly because we are the ones, the members of the treating team are usually involved in the care of the patient till the end. And we sometimes are the link between the patient and the family members. So it's, a, it's, it's an equally traumatic experience for both the patient and the family and the members of the treating team because of the rapidity of the situation. The comorbidities. And also because of comorbidities, yeah. Is there anything in the chat? Okay. Uh, just briefly mentioning how do the patients with COVID-19 present. So uh, you usually it presents a subclinical presentation where people have the virus, but they don't have any symptoms. Uh, the other common presentation is the symptoms of uh, upper respiratory infection, so fever, cough, and mild symptoms, uh, who, get, who are able to transmit the virus. Then uh, they can be flu-like symptoms, um, but when they become very, very severe, uh, the severe illness is the one that we always worry about, and that can present with the symptom complex of breathlessness and agitation. Now, the good thing is that 80% still, still 80% have mild illness. It's only the 5% uh, who end up having the critical illness, and they end up having uh, the severe illness, and which has got a symptom complex of breathlessness and agitation. And what we have, uh, there's been description about uh, people who die with the symptom complex or the COVID-19 lung disease, usually there's a, uh, there's a high grade of all the symptoms. So it's, what is described is that there's high breathlessness or air hunger, high distress, high delirium and agitation, high fever. And uh, what happens is the end of life care death occurs pretty quickly or a short time or hours or days, uh, usually short hours. So that is, that is why, again, it's an ultra emergency situation and you need to do things pretty quickly here. Okay. So coming back to Ramesh, um, everyone is in agreement that Ramesh should have conservative treatment based on his comorbidities and previous performance status and the present condition. The son has said again, please, so his son has said uh, again, please make sure he does not suffer. So he's more specific now, please make sure he does not suffer. You want to make sure Ramesh has the best symptom control and support and have sat on high flow oxygen. We did some investigations and chest x shows bilateral lung infiltrates he has raised d dimer leukopenia, and raised transamnese. So you are the doctor looking after Ramesh, uh, or you're a healthcare professional looking after Ramesh. You're discussing with the senior colleagues what questions you want to ask your senior colleagues about Ramesh's management, and what are the key issues? So how will you go about managing Ramesh's symptoms? Please feel free to put on the chat. Yeah. What comes in your mind? What all can you do to make Ramesh comfortable? Propped up. Propped up, yeah. Propped up. Oxygenate and position sitting up. What else can you do? So give him some oxygen because it's hypoxic. Cool environment. Cool environment. Very good, yeah. Check what complaint he has. Ancelitic. Okay. Good. Ancelitic. Low dose morphine. Very good. Well mm. done, yeah. Ask him what he feels. Yes. Maybe nebulizer with saline to expectorate sputum if any pain relief with morphine. Sonali might have expect, I mean, intended morphine. Yeah. Nasal cannula, Nasal better. cannula better than Vinti mask. Why did you say that, Nivedia? Nasal cannula is better than Vinti mask? You can put in the chat box. For him to communicate. Okay. Yeah, very good, very good. Yeah. Very good. Treatment for raised D dimer, low molecular heparin melted. Low molecular raised heparin, a bronchodilator, gentle chest ECU. Ah, with nasal cannula, the damage may be able to talk and eat, drink well. Okay. Small sips of water, room proper ventilation. 
classifier and mild moderate severe. So I think Dr. Sadek has definitely gone to the ebook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mild moderate. Very good. Thank you. And start treatment on the basis of Bilganula, mucolytics, Vaseline for lips. Yeah. Dexamethasone. Dexamethasone. Comfortable position. When you say that the comfortable position is any particular position you would choose, medial prednisolone, general music if we prefer that, very good. It's really soothing. Any particular position that the participants would prefer with respect to COVID-19? Sitting up, reclining, sitting with pillows in front, prone, proper. Prone. Why do you say it? Prone position is, so I mean, proning. Why is it better in COVID-19? Bad leg down, okay. Yeah. Bad leg down, okay. Okay, support. Very good. That's really good. Thank you very much. I think you've you've seemed to have covered most most the uh, uh, you know management strategies, and also um, mentioning the uh, so I think prone position is found to be uh, better for COVID nineteen. Even though for symptomatically, we always advise propped up position. Uh, but specifically for COVID-19 proning is advised and also dexamethasone. So that's a recent latest trial. Now dexamethasone for COVID-19 has been shown to uh, have a better advantage on mortality. So people tend to live longer if they're on oxygen support and on ventilators. So the advice, uh, initially we were thinking we can give it for symptom management, but no. But obviously Ramesh needs oxygen. So you know, we can actually give dexamethasone at this stage, but uh, the same study, the recovery trial have shown that if you're not on oxygen, maybe they tend to actually not do better on dexamethasone or maybe dexamethasone is not indicated because they could die because of that. So it's tricky, this COVID-19. So I think for Ramesh's case, maybe we can give dexamethasone, but it's actually for mortality prevention or you know, prevention of death. That's the, it's, it's actually a landmark trial as far as COVID is uh, concerned. Uh, only one that shows some evidence. Um, Anita, okay. would you like to comment on nebulizers? Sorry if I am interrupting you. No, 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 no. Yeah, so nebulizers again, the other one, uh, while we're doing the ebook, we had this discussion. And again, because it's an aerosol generating uh, procedure, uh, we would, we, what we suggested was to avoid nebulizations, uh, especially if it's in a hospital setting. Now, if, the, if by any chance a person is in the ward, and again, in, in, in countries where there's lo lots of cases, people were, had end of life at, 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 at home. And then actually they can continue with the nebulizers and, uh, you know, uh, that was the general advice that was given. Yes, yeah, steroids with decreasing some inflammation for symptom relief, definitely. Okay. So moving on, again, Rajman will keep an eye on the chats. I'll Very good. My talk. Um, so, so... Again, this is a complex pathologies in COVID-19. It's a complex pathophysiology. This is a cytokine storm is there, there's hyperinflammatory stage, the thrombosis. Uh, all these come together. There can be consolidation, sometimes it's plural effusion. So it is a complex pathophysiology. What else contributes to the pathologies in COVID-19? The vulnerable to the patient, his age, his comorbidities. All the anxiety, we discuss everything, the information loading, the, the, uh, you know, the internet, uh, there's no different treatment so far, the isolation, all the psychosocial issues of guilt, anger, fear, and loss of income. So all these contribute to breathlessness. And just as you suggested in, in the slides, so all these has to be targeted if you really have to manage properly uh, the breathlessness symptom as such in COVID-19. So that is why it becomes very, very difficult. Now, uh, always, always follow the COVID-19 management protocol. We're not saying anything to uh, you know, stop that. All our treatment can be continued along with the COVID-19 management protocol. So we discuss some of the correctable factors or so some of the medications you can be given, but is there anything else that, that you've left out, anything else that you can think of? If you, if you, if you, if you think of his, about his comorbidities and uh, if you can think of his becoming breathless, is there anything else that you can give him to make him more comfortable? So what are the other medical causes you can, or medical management you can do to, uh, to uh, remish? Anything else? So we, I think we've mentioned low molecular heparin because the chance of PE. Um, uh, yeah, cuffs are present. Yeah, good. Um, you can give inhalers, so you can do bronchospasm. Uh, 
uh, antidepressants um, yeah i think it's a psychological symptoms this will be taken again in in the in, uh, classes so there will be uh, if there's issues of uh, you know uh, psychological symptoms of depression depression then probably you can you can uh, start him on antidepressant but uh, the problem is uh, he might not have if he's actually dying he might not have the you know time for the antidepressant to take effect antibiotics yeah very good uh, infection said so it is psychosocial support so um yeah anything else raji ma'am no go ahead so yeah, yeah. so the only other thing that had had come to my mind was diuretics so you know with this history of um, heart failure and hypertension probably he's a bit of heart failure so you can give him uh, some flusamide also to make him more comfortable so you've given all the medical management all the medical uh, you know for breathlessness and still he's still breathless so that's where we have we have actually given the guidelines for the management of refractory breathlessness where the breathlessness is not improving despite optimal medical management and so all the uh, all the uh, you know the, the points that we have mentioned in our guidance is related to the um, refractory breathlessness so we discussed all this positioning the patient relaxation techniques breathing techniques and cooling of face cooling of face has been mentioned what about relaxation techniques and, and any sort of breathing exercise are you familiar with that is anything any any breathing exercise that you can think of you can put in chat so these are the non non pharmacological techniques that can be used for breathlessness management um raj ma'am can you keep an eye on the chat are they are they putting any open mouth open mouth breathing yeah have, one is to three inhalation to exhalation mm mm-hmm. mm mm-hmm. Okay, expand stomach during inhalation. Deep breathing exercise. Good, very good. Yeah. Use incentive spirometry for use of this. Um, mm, incentive spirometry. Can he do that? That is what incentive spirometry. Bit questionable. The spirometer breathing practices. Deep breathing. Yes, yeah, so slow down breathing. Double time of exhalation. Mm-hmm. Open mouth breathing. One is three inhalation. Exhale. Smell a flower and blow a candle. Very good. I was going to say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Spend time. Um, so, Doctor Nivedi has asked, "Can he do it?" Which is a very good question. So, again, uh, all these are only possible depending on the patient. Uh, you know, sometimes he may not be able to do all the non-pharmacological techniques. Chest physio, if advisable. Firstly, breathing. Yeah. Uh, breathing, yeah. Uh, you, have you all heard of uh, using fans for breathlessness? Please put in chat if yes. So cool air or fans for breathlessness? It's it's something that is coming up and it's got lots of evidence. But again, uh, you, you can you can actually keep a hand tilt fan quite close to your face, fifteen centimeters. It's supposed to stimulate the trigeminal nerves and uh, stimulate the respiratory centers and relax your breathing. But again, because of the infection risk of COVID nineteen, we don't generally advise that. But we use cooling of the face with uh, you know the flannel, cold flannels and cold rooms. So that's the other thing of non pharmacological management which is not advised in COVID nineteen is fans. Okay, so lot there are lots of uh, you know respiratory breathing techniques which can be uh, as appropriate, uh, appropriate to the situation can be treated to the uh, can be taught to the patient if possible. Uh, so coming to uh, and I'm going straight to the slide because one is because somebody has mentioned morphine. So how many of uh, how many of you use morphine for, to manage breathlessness in palliative care? Please put in chat as yes or no, and and uh, for how many of you morphine is available to use also. Please put in chat. So it's, it's coming. Yeah, it's available. Good, good. If you don't have it, please put no. Then I can I can know who 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 doesn't have morphine and who has not heard of using. Sorry, not morphine not available. Doctor Himani, which place are you from? Can you just put in your chat? Oh. Gujarat, okay, Jamnagar, Gujarat. Yeah, not very sure. Okay, what about IV morphine? Um, is it oral morphine or IV morphine that's not available? Not sure, ma'am. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, 
And so I think lots of people have heard about morphine being used for breathlessness. So whatever we've, we've given here, uh, again, gui just guidance. Uh, the dosage is just guidance. Uh, it's a starting dose. Again, change dose according to your patient. And uh, can, can anybody put in chat how uh, morphine works for breathlessness? So I don't, I don't have to go into, yeah, oral morphine available, jam necker. Okay. So how, why do you use morphine for breathlessness? So uh, can anybody tell me what's the role of morphine? How does it work? So morphine is actually shown to reduce the hyperventilative response to hypercapnia. Um, and uh, that, that means the respiratory rate comes down and also the, the, the result of breathing comes down, the work of breathing comes down. It also can pose uh, pulmonary water dilatation. Uh, that is uh, the two, two different ways. And also morphine uh, actually works on the opioid uh, receptors in the, in the higher brain stems also. And therefore, it causes sedation of the cortical center. Therefore, the feeling of breathlessness is reduced. And this has been proved in a randomized controlled trial with oral morphine in chronic breathlessness. So morphine definitely has a um, role in breathlessness and proven role in breathlessness. Yeah, anxiety reduced by it. Reduce the work of breathing, vast duration, pain relief, and sedation. Very good, Dr. Sanali. And double effect is different. Um, sensation double effect. Somebody has mentioned double effect, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Um, good. And also, because it's associated anxiety, we've also added a bit of midazolam. So you know that this uh, anxiety comes on to breathlessness. So we've uh, given a bit of benzodiazepine. So we can add either midazolam and lorazepam. Uh, and again, the other option is, so the doses that we've given is you can either give us a bolus doses uh, intermittently. So uh, as you know, it was oral morphine every fourth hourly um, or subcut morphine every fourth hourly. Now, midazolam, uh, again, fourth hourly. Now, if, so if you have to do that, a healthcare worker has to go into the patient every four hours, which again, is there's a risk of infection. So the ideal thing, and also for better symptom control, is always better to start a continuous infusion of morphine and midazolam over 24 hours. Now that, that is something that we do in our practice here. Again, I would like to put on chat, um, have you done this before? Like in your practice, have you started on a continuous infusion of morphine and midas or morphine alone or combination drugs in your, in your practice? Yes, IV morphine, yeah. So not subcutaneous. Have you, have you done subcutaneous morphine infusion? S2 IV morphine? No to subcutaneous. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, because in palliative care, we always advise for uh, sub-Q morphine. Um, mainly because, uh, you know, it's less traumatic. You can do it even at home. Uh, you don't need much of expertise. You can even tease a family for that. So... If a, in a end of life, if you subcut morphine, but not as uh, for symptom management. Okay. What about the combination of morphine and medicine? Have you tried that for patients? Use IV morphine for inpatient. Yeah. Infusion pumps not available at present place of work. Yeah, that is a very good point. Now, again, I've worked in two, two hospitals in Kerala. So one of them, infusion pumps are available. So you can actually, it's very useful. You can titrate it. But if it's not available, what we normally do is we take a 500 ml normal saline bag and you add all the medication you have to give over 24 hours into it. And then obviously the nurses know how to calculate that that goes over 24 hours. So that's a rough calculation, not ideal, but that's, that's what we could do if the pumps are not available, just a normal saline bag, but the drip rate the nurses have to adjust. Midas, morphine, and halopidol. So Dr. Nivedi has actually tried three together. Very good. Uh, yeah, so you can give, when I come to the last slide, um, you know, we can uh, actually, uh, I discuss that also. Okay. So um, moving on. Now, this is the algorithm. It's given in page 14. Uh, 
Uh, and as you can see, and, and somebody if you've mentioned what, how, how we've managed is we've given the management according to ICU and what, and uh, we've suggested non-pharmacological and pharmacological management in both ICU and what. And in pharmacological, the only difference in the medication is uh, in some ICUs, they prefer using fentanyl. So depending on that, we've given suggested a dose of fentanyl also. Now, again, depends on whether you've got that, um, we've got fentanyl available. The other thing is um, if morphine uh, for renal failure patients, uh, ideally, uh, uh, it's preferable to use fentanyl. So again, it depends on whether fentanyl is available or not. So again, uh, have you have used fentanyl for blood vessels? Have you used fentanyl in palliative care? Please type yes or no if it's available in your setting. Yeah, okay. So uh, what what we have dosages that we given is the suggested dosage for managed breath lessons using fentanyl and we have as one of the doctors mentioned we have divided it to mild moderate and severe and we've also given a box where if the significant respiratory distress at the end of life we can set a combined infusion with morphine and midazolam for breath lessons at the end of life and dosage has also has been suggested okay moving on coming back to our remish so Ramesh has been uh, stable for a day, but the staff has noticed that he is becoming agitated, mumbling incoherently and trying to remove his mask. The nurse looking uh, after him feels he is frightened. What do you feel is the cause of his symptoms and how will you assess and manage a new problem? So what do you think is happening to Ramesh now? He's delirious. Yes, Dr. Nevelia. Yes. Yeah. What could be the cause of his delirium? What do you think is happening with him? Anxiety and morphine induced. That is a very good point. Possible. Yeah. Hypoxia. I mean also. Yeah. Anything else? This is agitation, delirium scale. Anxiety, denial. Glycemic levels. Yes. Very good. I see your psychosis. Well done. Uh, actually, it's true, isn't it? Because uh, he's alone. It's typically, he's not in an ICU, but he's alone. So he's not seeing anybody. So it's a psychosis of that, isn't it? Yeah. Good. Dehydration. Claustrophobic. Okay, that's the other, other point that I want to raise. So do you, um, are you thinking he's in ICU because he's on a morphine infusion? Can you, uh, are you comfortable starting morphine infusion in the ward? Because I had this problem when I, when I was working on the hospital that the nurses were saying, okay, if you want to start morphine infusion, uh, you need to transfer him to ICU. I think Chari, my ma'am might remember the patient I'm talking about. So is there, is there any, any problem like that in the setting, setting where you work? Can you give a morphine infusion in the ward? How many of you are comfortable giving morphine infusion in the ward? Okay, so I think, uh, okay, right. Not comfortable in giving ward. Right, okay. Right, okay. So, you, so the reason you've mentioned ICU psycho is because you think he's been managed in ICU uh, with an infusion. Okay. Uh, in, in palliative care settings and even in, in, in Kerala or wherever you're working, we can, we can, there are hospitals who do morphine infusion in board. And if you actually go to, um, you know, Western countries, we do morphine infusion at home also. But obviously, they, the nursing staff go every day and they can change the syringe pump every day. So it's a bit more monitored. Uh, but you can't do it in the board. You don't have to move a patient to ICU just to give morphine infusion. Um, because we don't need a proper, so that's cannot ensure proper observation because you don't need a, any sort of op, op, observation for that. You don't do any vitals when you do that. We're just starting a low dose of morphine to tie to the symptoms. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you give boluses if it's um, not, uh, not settling. So we're not doing vitals for that patient. Uh, we are just, you know, doing a proper palliative care, making him comfortable in the ward. Uh, this is a known COVID scenario because the reason we are, I'm telling that is because, uh, you know, if a patient who is end of life, you transfer him to ICU just for a morphine infusion, that means he's not being with the family when he's dying, isn't it? So you can and you should, wherever you're practicing palliative care, if possible, try to make a change of doing this. Uh, we started a, um, 
allowing natural death unit in the hospital where uh, we used to work, me and Shadow Ma'am. And we had a cubicle where we used to uh, actively shift patients out of ICU and give them infusion in the ward so that people can be managed in the ward. Uh, and they can be with the family. So you can give, even fentanyl you can give in the ward. Uh, you know, you just, have to make, you just have to be confident and to give confidence to your nurses uh, because that is very, very important. I think I'm deviating. Uh, okay. Uh, I remember staff, Patch, I remember said, Panic can say, you don't do this here. Exactly. So it's the confidence that we give to the staff. Uh, and we, we talked to them and said, you know, we can't do it. Uh, I remember, I think fentanyl, we still had some problem in the ward, but definitely more often we were doing it in ward. Okay, coming back to Ramesh here. Uh, anything else you can think of? Uh, you've mentioned delirium, you mentioned hypoxia, hypoglycemia. Um, anything else that you can think of? And um, how will you manage his symptoms? How will you manage his new problem? Uh, hello, Pirado. Well done, yeah, thank you. Sedation. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, as you said, it is it, he he is delirious. Now this is a this is a slide I got from uh, one of the COVID uh, pro providing palliative care uh, in a Facebook page where they have they have actually commented on these doctors looking after patients with COVID nineteen at end of life care even when uh, for symptom management they've seen horrendous delirium for COVID and nothing seems to be touching it and um, they have to, they have ruled out all the reversible factors. They've even coined a term of COVID encephalopathy because uh, there, was, there was nothing else going on. Extensive medical work was done. And uh, you know, uh, what they've done is, they've, uh, one, one doctor has mentioned, my only success was after aggressive bowel regimen, gentle hearing aids, and ensuring that they worked, having a translator available and doing a deep dive re and realize that patient has been in a usual pain regimen. So what are the other things that you can think of? So uh, again, delirium is very common in COVID-19, but don't forget the other causes of delirium uh, also, not just COVID-19. COVID um, and again, this one I got, um, it's from the um, Association for Geriatrics, where uh, they've produce this guideline which says that um, older patients, so I'm just, I just got this slide because watch out for delirium. So old, this is an atypical presentation, older adults, not with fever and the usual symptoms. Older adults actually can just present with delirium and they can, they have turned out to be positive for COVID-19. So it's, 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 it's now found to be very, very common. And um, so how do you assess that? We have, again, we have su suggested a short tool that can be used. Uh, there are lots of tools available to assess delirium. Uh, what, what we are suggesting in the ebook is a 480 delirium assessment tool, um, which, um, you know, we assess the patient's alertness. Um, so either they're fully alert, then they score zero. And if they're abnormal, they score four. Then you ask four simple questions, uh, their age, the date of birth, whether the name of the hospital and the current year. Again, if they're able to answer without any mistake, they don't score anything, but there's two or more mistakes, they score two. Uh, then ask the patient to count backwards, um, seven months backwards, list the months of the year for backwards. So if they do more than at least seven months currently, they don't score anything. But um, if it's untestable or they can't count, then they score two. And then you look for any acute change or, or fluctuating goals. Now that probably might be difficult to assess because the patient might be alone. So you need to get a collateral history from the family. So if, this, uh, if there is a score of more than four, then uh, it, it can be possible delirium. So if you, if you, if you forget COVID-19, then what are, the, what are the cause of delirium? What are other things can you think of? Uh, we've mentioned hypoxia and hypoglycemia. Anything else you, you want to mention? Electrolyte abnormality? Uh, urinary infection, they have suggested they have come forward suggestions like uh, urinary infection, okay. constipation. Yeah, so I think they've, then they've covered everything, isn't it? Yeah, good. Uh, and so, you know, always, the, even though the COVID is the diagnosis, always think of the other causes. So it can be the patient can still be in pain or they could be withdrawing from the pain medication. They're already taking some pain medication, which we couldn't provide because of lockdown uh, or, you know, alcohol withdrawal. Again, lockdown comes into play. Deathlessness, um, retention, constipation. So correct, uh, look, look for all the correctable causes, correct all, all of that. And then uh, you do a symptomatic management for anxiety and delirium. And again, it's, it's given in your ebook. Uh, 
I am only mentioning the algorithm. Details are in the ebook. In the algorithm, we've given a guidance to we've actually divide the patient into two groups. So one is agitated and disoriented. That is a proper delirium. So you got a delirium diagnosis. And the second group is agitated patient, but he is still oriented. So it means anxiety, panic, and fear. Now, again, both these groups we have divided into mild, moderate, and severe intractable symptoms. The only difference is that, so you've mentioned both medications to us, uh, haloperidol and lorazepam. Now, in the first line medication, if the patient has still oriented, we go for a benzodiazepine. So we give either lorazepam or clonazepam if they're able to take it orally. Or if not able to solo, you go for midazolam, a subcut. Again, dosage is different when they become mild to moderate. Now, if the patient's delirious, you go haloperidol as first line. And to both of this, and if they become severe, moderate to severe, you add the second drug in. So if the patient, you start first line haloperidol, if they're not symptom, uh, settling down, you add a benzodiazepine to that. And uh, when they've got intractable or severe symptoms or end of life, uh, you can give a combined uh, infusion. And as I mentioned, you can give a combined infusion of, uh, again, some doses suggestions are given. Uh, just for reference, um, do it according to your patient. You can give a combined infusion of haloperidol and midazolam. And um, if, if the patient obviously has a symptom complex of breathlessness, agitation, and delirium, you go for a combined infusion of morphine, haloperidol, and midazolam, depending on the availability. Uh, okay. Anything else in the chat, uh, ma'am, before I move on? Last couple of slides. Oh, they, they are coming forward with suggestions. I mean, the causes, the possible causes for delirium, like hypercarbia, hypoxia, separation from daylight, diurnal variation, not appreciated. That it's a possibility. Uh, yeah. In ICU. So, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually you have to try, even though in the slides I haven't mentioned, uh, in the webinar we have gone clearly into the non-pharmacological management of uh, you exactly. know, delirium also. So uh, educate daylight, light in the room, you know, glasses, uh, hearing aids, um, you know, uh, familiar surroundings, all these things uh, can help. So do all that and then go to the uh, ph pharmacological management. The, actually, the current guidelines, they don't even suggest using pharmacological management because uh, nothing actually seems to work. Even if you go for the, you know, evidence-based uh, evidence medicine, even haloperidol doesn't seem to work. But uh, what we say is if it's harm to self or harm to others, definitely you have to give something. So that's, that's where these medicines are given for suggestions. Only. Okay. Um, last couple of slides. Again, uh, we have got this in details in the ebook. Management of pain. You must be familiar with this because you have done your uh, has some experience on palliative care. We have divided the pain according to severity of mild, moderate, and severe, and uh, we've just used uh, used the WHO ladder here. So uh, for mild, you go for paracetamol, and again the doses are given, and uh, we opioid and then go to strong opioid. You suggested given given the suggested doses here, and also advised about the NSAID. And lastly, uh, I just want to mention the list of essential medications. Uh, this is not clear when you when you look at it now, but it's all in the in the ebook. Uh, this is a list that has been compiled, adapted from the WHO and the IHPC list, so International Association of Hospice and Palliative Care, has given this list of essential medication. Now, these uh, any 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 hospital or any country or anywhere you have to set up a palliative care uh, center or palliative care hospital is ideal that all these medications are, are there. Uh, again, we don't have every, every one of these, but we should try and see whether we can get them. And these are the medication which can manage most of the symptoms in palliative care. So this list is available for you in the ebook, and uh, the medicines that's mentioned in in the ebook are given in bold. So it's for, for you for your reference. Uh, I'd like to summarize uh, by saying that it's important to recognize the uh, symptom complex of agitation and breathlessness and um, Opioids should be made available. If you are planning to manage uh, or for the palliative care aspect of COVID-19, opioid is a, is a must. Uh, make sure it's available. And uh, 480 delirium assessment tool can be used. Um, also remember to assess and manage other causes of delirium. And uh, again, so we've, we've given you the further resources and training. Anybody who's interested in learning more about palliative care to have further training, there's some resources available. Uh, all these slides will be shared with you. And um, I would also like to uh, request you to um, sort of give a feedback so that there'll be a feedback form. There'll be post course questionnaire that'll be sent down to you. Please do fill it up. Um, and it's important for us to know, uh, you know, how you like the course and what changes we have to make to make it, make it better. Thank you very much. I hand over to Raji, ma'am. Uh, 
Sunita, I am just uh, raising a question from chat that can we use morphine 2.5 milligram for hourly for breathlessness in moderate pain? Uh, you, you, I mean, it depends. I mean, you can use, um, if the patient's got moderate pain, probably you need higher dose of uh, morphine to treat that pain. 2.5 might not be enough, and that should cover the breathlessness also. So you don't have to do an additional dose uh, uh, of morphine just for breathlessness. That's the question, right? Yes, exactly. And uh, I would like to comment on, Sonali has commented on, uh, the patient may be asked to do repetitive tasks. And see, we can assist delirium. I mean, while ass assisting delirium, I would like to comment on that point. No, though I have put it in the chat box because if you if you ask the patient to do the task repetitively, he may over a period of time he may learn it, and he may do it properly. So that could be misleading. In the 4AT scale itself, and delirium is supposed to I mean you're supposed to assess periodically. No, so if you are asking the patient in the morning that you know like count the, uh, or name the months backwards from December. So you are asking that in the morning and you are asking that in the afternoon and you are asking that in the night, you know. So by the time night, the patient can learn that and we can automatically, something like an automated reply, he can, he, he can reply according to that. So for it delirium, uh, may not, that aspect may not be uh, very good in assessing. Uh, I mean, after all, it is a screening tool only. Uh, you you have to go for confirmatory tools later. But you know, I was just commenting on Sonali's uh, post. You know, repetitive tasks may not be good at all times, particularly when you assess delirium. Okay. And uh, uh, one person has commented history of. Then I couldn't see the rest. Uh, I, I, Achilles. Achilles or? Ah, yes, Achilles symbol. History of then he had left it. I mean, could you please complete that? Achilles? I had a delirium patient in past nine days, withdrawal symptoms. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's a very good point, Sunita, because we have to extract that history from any patient, not only in COVID scenario, yeah. drug withdrawal could be a prominent cause for delirium. Very good that you brought out that point. And in COVID-19, particularly in Kerala, because of the alcohol restriction, could be yeah. another problem. Sunita, would you like to add some points on that? Doc, Dr. Sonali uh, mentioned about, um, you know, uh, whether benzos will worsen the delirium. So that's why we have divided it into anxiety with disorientation. We give a halocardialist first line. If there's disorientation, we don't start with benzo. So once you give the antipsychotic, then we're okay to give benzodiazepine. So we don't give that first line, mainly because if they're disoriented, if you give benzos, uh, it can worsen the delirium. Fractures causing pain, pain, untreated pain, or suboptimally treated pain can cause delirium, or precipitate delirium. Have you ever thought why antipsychotics are preferred in uh, uh, patients with delirium, particularly with confusion? You can put in the chat box. Why benzodiazepines are less preferred and antipsychotics are preferred in delirium, particularly when it is you know, confusion, confused. Respiratory depression for medicine. Oh, no. in, in delirium, actually, there is a, a imbalance between, I mean, neurotransmitters, noradrenaline, dopamine, GABA, ACH, and usually it is supposed to be having a dopaminergic surge. So, antipsychotics will be useful in suppressing that haloperidol, which is the time tested 
dopamine antagonist will be useful to suppress that that is one of the reasons why uh, antipsychotics principally dopamine antagonists are preferred when um, in a delirious patient in the risk so you know, like uh, so today uh, probably we are uh, about to close the session and if you have any uh, doubts you can put in the chat box we have uh, discussed symptom management today uh, i mean uh, you know like uh, how to what is the importance of assessing and managing symptoms properly and how to go beyond physical causes for symptom management and what are the principal i mean what are the principal symptoms with which the patient can present and what are the most distressing symptoms which the patient can have all symptoms are important for the patient but the symptoms which may pose challenge to both healthcare professionals as well as patients and families so today sunitha had discussed in detail regarding breathlessness and agitation management how to manage when the symptoms are mild moderate and when they are refractory and she had touched upon pain as pain and fever as uh, comparatively mild symptoms but still they do occur and uh, you know she had shown the essential uh, medication list which, which are quite well summarized in the toolkit and uh, you know uh, we may close the session uh, with uh, Uh, i mean there is another an uh, uh, two questions like uh, could you please discuss about atypical symptoms in covid 19 could you please elaborate that so i think are they asking for what are the other presentations like uh, you mean um, anos i mean anosmia dysgeusia fatigue Can and diarrhea flank pain flank pain oh so right now the re recent one is both anosmia and agusia has been uh, i think who has added that as a list and icmr also has added that as a list to the to the symptoms diarrhea is there for, for some time now fever cough uh, breathlessness diarrhea um abdominal pain i think flank pain i have noticed that uh a delirium obviously you know for elderly it's it's a presenting symptom children uh, you know the severe uh, uh, the covid can present as something like a kawasaki disease apparently yes uh, yeah it is seen even in adolescents it is reported in adolescents also yeah but i don't think who or i mean any other uh, agency has come forward with guidelines for managing those atypical symptoms you know no 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 routinely no. manage i mean how it is being routinely managed it is followed yeah there is no specific guidelines for that yeah for cough again we have given some suggestions uh, in the ebook i haven't covered it here but uh, in uh, and the other important point that we haven't covered is secretions again its guidelines are given in the ebook uh, all the drugs that is is that you normally familiar with so glycovant and abascofan doses we have given it will be covered with end of life care it's covered in end of life care okay. and dnr one person has come forward with a question like dnr is it practiced it it, it depends all a lot on the uh, living will and the patient wish dnr is do not resist it no it depends on you know, whether the patient has expressed a will like that It's so Dr. Roop is not here today, but Dr. Roop has yeah. they have recently published an article on DNR in India, quite recently. Um, it had come in. Uh, Dr. Charu, are you aware of that? Uh, the ICMR. Somebody has they have published on DNR uh, and the legality of that. The ICMR has ICMR. done it. Yeah, and it's a question paper which uh, I'll just get the link. Charu has actually. left typing. Okay, okay. Smriti will get the link for that. It's a uh, yeah. She'll put that in ch ch chat box. Probably. Then, let me see whether I can get it from you for, for uh, you know like end of life care discussion. Whether yeah. Uh, let me see whether I can get it from you. We can take it up in end of life care discussion. Yeah. That's that's a good it, idea. We may not be in a position to have an elaborate discussion on that, but still, uh, hope I will be able to mention that. so up to close session sunida with a, something relaxing for the students yeah breathing exercise for the students for the participants for all of us yeah <laughs> all of us maybe yeah need okay uh, that's enough yeah
So, how are we going to do that with a breathing exercise or something like that? Yeah, we can we can do a breathing exercise. So, are you going to take the lead? No, no, no. You you can do the lead, ma'am. Oh, <laughs> I'll okay. follow your orders. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, all the participants, are you here? Are you here? Hope all of you are yes, here. Yes, 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 yes. We can put the video on. We'd like to see you all do that if possible. Yeah, we are. I mean, before winding up the session, we are going to do a small exercise uh, to make all of us relaxed. You can, you can, all of you can close your eyes, sit relaxed on the chair with feet on the ground. If you can do that. Hmm? And close your eyes with feet on the ground. And if you are relaxing or reclining on the bed, don't bother about jumping up and putting your feet on the ground. I mean, you be relaxed on the bed. And think of your favorite place, a beach, the wilderness of forest, or top of a hill, or in the home, wherever you are. Hmm? Are you in? Have you closed your eyes? You are relaxed now? You are in the extreme serene and calm environment. Are you feeling that? Now take a deep breath slowly. Breathe slowly. 